we'll start now the first colloquium. So we'll have a talk right after this at 2.30. So this one uh, is by Rafael Batista. Um, so the idea is to make this informal so you can interrupt, um, ask questions as you like. There are people attending by Zoom who also can feel free to interrupt whenever they want. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Nathan, and thanks, everyone, for giving me the opportunity to talk today about uh, multi-messenger insights into the ultra-high-energy universe. So what I'm going to talk about today, it seems to be very broad at first, but I promise there is a connection be between everything that I'm going to talk about, okay? As the slides go by, you'll see the connection between all the topics. So uh, when I say multi-messenger here, I'm not going to all the messengers. I'm focusing, focusing mostly on uh, high-energy neutrinos, high-energy gamma rays, and high-energy cosmic rays. So uh, it's multi-messengers at high energies only. And uh, to get started, <clears throat> so usually the overview for, of this talk is the following. We have cosmic particles, whatever type of particle we are dealing with, may it be cosmic rays or gamma rays or neutrinos. Oops, sorry, let me just time it, yeah or neutrinos, or gamma rays, and so on. And if we have these cosmic particles, and we are looking to do some kind of astrophysics, if we want to learn how these particles were generated in the universe, which types of processes produced them, and how, in which types of extreme astrophysical environments, they could have been accelerated to very high energies, well, we need to have some kind of information about the fundamental physics and the cosmology. The cosmology will essentially tell us tell us uh, how the particles travel in the universe, and the fundamental physics will essentially tell us how the particles interact during their journey from the source to Earth, right? Uh, so the arrow goes... If you're looking for information about the cosmic accelerator, so this is essentially astrophysics, we need these two ingredients, and uh, if we have these cosmic particles, we can do some kind of astrophysics. But if you are looking for some kind of information about, for example, fundamental physics. So if we wanted to study processes that differ from the standard model processes that we have today, uh, like if you are looking for signatures of Lorentz invariance violation and other kinds of things, for instance, uh, we would need to go in this direction. So uh, we would need information about the cosmology. We would need information about which type of cosmic accelerators are emitting these particles and the arrow would go in this direction. Similarly, for the cosmology, right? I think there is a very strong delay here. Uh, yeah. OK, so if we wanted to study cosmology, like understand photon backgrounds in the universe, for example, the cosmic microwave background or the extragalactic background light, which comprises all types of, of electromagnetic radiation along, uh, across the whole spectrum, or, for example, if you were if you want to study magnetic fields in the universe, so essentially do cosmology, large-scale uh, studies, we would need information coming from these cosmic particles. If we know the sources and if we know the fundamental physics, so how these particles interact, we can go in this direction, right? Uh, let's see if it appears. Okay, yeah, now it's going. So yeah, the arrow goes in this direction. I'm sorry, yeah, just go with my hand, it's probably faster. So uh, what I'm going to talk to about today is essentially about all types of messengers, particle messengers that we have in the universe. This plot, it's very busy, but it essentially shows cosmic ray measurements. So cosmic rays are essentially atomic nuclei at different types of energies, the energy shown here. We also have here, for example, uh, gamma rays. We also have neutrinos shown in the same plot. And here, it's also indicated the maximum energy uh, in the lab frame that the LHC can reach, which is about 10 to the 16 electron volts, more or less, right? And uh, what I'm going to study, talk about today, are essentially the cosmic rays here in this orange region, which are the roughly the high and the ultra-high energy cosmic rays, shown here, the high energy neutrinos, shown here, and uh, high energy gamma rays that are shown here. And uh, just to clean up a little bit the picture, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about these cosmic rays, these neutrinos, and these gamma rays. But you could ask, okay, but the energy range, it goes from 1 GV 
up to 10 to the 21 electron volts, so that would be one Z EV. And this energy range is very large, but all these processes, they are connected to each other through some kind of uh, fundamental process that generates one type of particle, for example, here we have neutrinos, from another type of particle. So these cosmic rays at these energies could give rise, for instance, to these neutrinos and to these gamma rays at lower energies. Okay, so this there is a fundamental connection between these three different messengers, and this connection can cover around 12 orders of magnitude in energy, which is very interesting. And how can we study this type of uh, cosmic messengers? This is just a cartoon picture of how we study cosmic messengers at high energies in general. So these particles, let's take, for example, cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are atomic nuclei. They just enter the atmosphere, and as they hit the top of the atmosphere, they interact with the nitrogen and the air, essentially, and they produce a cascade of other types of particles. We see here many mesons, neutrons, protons, and so on. And these first interactions taking place at the top of the atmosphere, it emits some kind of uh, fluorescence light that can be detected by fluorescence detectors at Earth. Similarly, it can be detected by fluorescence detectors on space. So if we have like a satellite looking down on Earth, this satellite will essentially observe also this type of uh, fluorescence light being emitted. And uh, as the cascade develops, we see like there is also an electromagnetic component full of uh, photons and electrons and so on. And uh, there is also a hadronic component with pions that generates muons, neutrinos, and so on. And all these particles, they can be detected by, water, for example, water Cherenkov tanks. These are essentially particle detectors. Uh, water Cherenkov tanks are just one example of the types of detectors that can uh, measure these particles. Sorry, the satellite detectors, they need to come out of the atmosphere in order to be detected? I'm just looking at the picture. So the yeah. decay is in the atmosphere, and then it goes the, outside the atmosphere to hit the sun. The light goes, yes. The decay, uh, the interactions start here, but this emits like fluorescence light. The fluorescence light, yeah. it will essentially not scatter to first order, and it can be observed either from space or from Earth. But what? it doesn't detect directly the cosmic rays? No, the detection okay. is completely indirect. Okay. Okay. Not only cosmic rays, this is also true for whatever type of particle we are talking about. Whatever type of high-energy particle hits the atmosphere, impinges upon the atmosphere, can produce this type of shower. So once you build a particle detector like this, you can detect all types of particles at high energies. The spacing of these tanks will essentially be proportional to the number of particles that are generated, which is proportional to the energy, uh, and so on. N not at these energies. At these energies, we are talking about cosmic rays with, uh, for example, these cosmic rays that I'm talking about here, and as I've shown in the previous plot, they have energies above 10 to the 16 electron volts. Therefore, the Lorentz factor is at least 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. Uh, and, it, you know, the, jet, the angle, it's very boosted. It's like 10 to the minus 6 radians or so. So uh, it's essentially, uh, yeah, therefore, this emission, it's not very isotropic. It's essentially boosted uh, in one direction. And uh, if we have gamma rays, gamma rays can be detected depending on the energy directly in space, but at higher energies, they cannot be detected directly in space. They have to go through some kind of process similar to this, like they can produce a particle shower, and this particle shower emits some kind of radiation. In this case, it's not properly the fluorescence, it's different. Uh, it's a Cherenkov light, essentially, because the process is physically different, and this Cherenkov light is detected by ground-based observatories. So uh, this type of detector, like satellites, as an example, we have the Fermi Large Area Telescope, which is a satellite in space observing gamma rays with energies above 100 uh, MeV up to 300 GeV. And here, these type of telescopes, they usually observe things up around or above 30 GeV. Okay, so this is for the uh, most energetic ones. But you need the complementarity of techniques, of course, to study the same kind of physical process. And uh, again, going to that type of plot that I had before, uh, we see here the three messengers that I'm talking about, 
once again, uh, we have here gamma rays, we have here neutrinos, and we have here cosmic rays. Forget about these bands for now. And if we just draw this line here, we notice that there is something interesting going on. The cosmic rays at 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 electron volts, they have this quantity like E squared times phi comparable to the neutrinos, comparable to the photons. And this quantity here, it's essentially the amount of energy per unit area, per unit time arriving at Earth. And the fact that they are comparable, it's interesting because, you know, you might say, okay, that's comparable, so it's something interesting. Are they related? If they are related, well, if this hypothesis is true, do they have a common origin? So if they have a common origin, this common origin can be something happening in an astrophysical object. So we have an astrophysical object that em emits this type of particle, and uh, it also emits this type of particles and this type of particles, like neutrinos, gamma rays, and cosmic rays, with more or less the same flux, right? That's why we see this apparent coincidence. Yeah. So uh, let me just talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. But uh, we have, if this hypothesis is true, we have a common origin. So this origin can be production in the source, or it can be some kind of production during the propagation. So, for example, these cosmic rays traveling in the universe, they bump onto a CMB photon, and uh, when they bump onto a CMB photon, uh, the cross-section for this process is such that it will produce like a, a resonance, and it will produce pions, whose decays generate gamma rays, and also neutrinos. And the bands shown here are just theoretical, not experimental, predictions, for the flux of cosmogenic neutrinos and cosmogenic photons. When I say cosmogenic, I'm referring exactly to this process that I just described, the propagation process. We have a cosmic ray, the cosmic ray bumps into a photon. It can be like a CMB photon, for example, it can be in another, uh, like photons of other energies. And this produces neutrinos and this produces photons. This is a very common process that happens in the universe, but these fluxes, they have never been detected. Uh, the bands, they are related to the uncertainties on the cosmic ray models. And we have like optimistic, and this one here, it's like compatible with this, right? These are, let's say, uh, realistic. This is optimistic because this one requires that these cosmic rays are protons instead of heavier nuclei. So if these cosmic rays are protons, we have this band. Otherwise, this band disappears and it's only that one. Uh, this is very important because this neutrinos and these photons, as I said, everything here connects, although I'm talking about different types of particles at different energies. If we observe this type of fluxes of neutrinos and gamma rays, that's telling us something about the ultra-high energies, which is remarkable, right? Uh, because they are like 10 in orders of magnitude in energy apart, and it's still telling us something about it. Once again, these fluxes have never been observed. Uh, there are experiments being built at the moment to detect exactly this type of flux, like the cosmogenic flux of uh, neutrinos. I'm going to mention briefly one of these experiments uh, in the end. Just mention, I'm not going to describe anything, uh, you know, so that you know. Uh, How do you know the cosmogenic or is produced by very important. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how do I know whether, it, if I, given that I observed one of these particles, how do I know if it's a cosmogenic or observed or if it's like produced by a source? In principle, I don't. That's the answer. But the model will help us differentiate it. Usually, if it's cosmogenic, like most of the process that generate cosmogenic neutrinos necessarily generates the photons. Because uh, let's suppose that I have like that, those cosmic rays that I'm talking about, they are protons, right? So I have a proton interacting with like a CMB photon. And this process. This is just the, the main channel. It produces a delta resonance whose decay can be something like, you know, uh, produces a bunch of particles, but the main one like pi zero or something plus, you know, a charged pion. Pi zero decays into two gamma rays. Therefore, that one. Pi plus, it decays into muons plus Neutrinos, and then the muon decays as, decay as well. So uh, if this is true, and if this is coming through the 
uh, proton channel necessarily or the neutron because it goes similarly. The branching ratio of these two processes, this is related to isospin symmetry. This is like one third and two thirds for the other. And therefore, you get the flux of neutrinos. It's about, uh, you know, two, one is two thirds of the other, essentially, right? Uh, therefore, the, this gives us a very solid constraint on how we can differentiate it. If it's a cosmological origin, we see also the gammas, we see the neutrinos, and we can just compare the models, and the total energy content there should be related by a factor of two-thirds uh, with respect to each other. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the unit. E squared phi is what? It's, it's energy per area, or it's energy squared per area? What is E squared phi? Yeah, uh, E squared phi is essentially, uh, I could just write this as E squared, the number of particles reaching a given unit area, mm -hmm. right, uh, per unit time, per unit energy. So uh, and therefore, E squared, this cancels out, and we get like the units of energy there. So it's uh, D3. Yeah. And you say that's the number that counts essentially how many neutrinos you have and how many photons yeah. you have? I yeah. See. This is essentially if I get like a slab, like uh, my detector, Okay. Uh, the area of my, de my detector has a given area. Of course, there is like also the solid angle there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but fine. yeah. But it's yeah, not whatever. proportional to energy. It just counts the number of neutrinos and. Photons. The number of neutrinos per area, per time, at a given energy. But why at a given energy? That's the part I don't understand. If you're just counting the number of. Don't you want to just compare the number of photons it hit as the number of neutrinos? Why does the yeah, energy play a role? Yeah, but the processes are energy dependent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't understand. But if you want to say that it's comparable because it's, you have the two branches, why did you put an factor of energy? I just don't understand the argument. No, the argument is just, uh, they, I'm, not, I'm saying that this is just a hypothesis. This is just a coincidence. No, I'm, oh, it's a coincidence. But I thought you were saying it's evidence for the fact that it's a common no, origin. I'm not, I never said it's evidence. Ah, I said okay, that okay. it's interesting. Okay. And it's remarkable that if we just draw this line, it's telling us that the amount of, in this energy beam, yeah, if I, I put one square meter, in one second, I get the same amount of uh, okay. uh, flux as here. Okay. That's it. Uh, okay. This is not a statement. And actually, that's very important to understand everything I have to say uh, later on, because I'm just raising this hypothesis, and I'm going to try to answer it with a few examples. Of course, I cannot cover the whole thing, but there are these two possibilities, right? The two things that I can think about. If this hypothesis is, too, is true, then either there is some kind of process happening in the source that establishes this relation, or some kind of process is happening during propagation that establishes this relation. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, next. So how do I connect these messengers? Well, usually when I'm talking about these different messengers, there are cosmic rays, there are electrons. I'm not mentioning electrons too much, because usually they die out very soon in the universe. So it's not really something that we can measure here at Earth. But they are important. Uh, in the interplay of all the other types of processes, as we will see uh, in one of my next slides. So the question is, I showed those types of particles at different energies. How do they get to those energies? Which kind of astrophysical process can accelerate particles to very high and ultra-high energies? Uh, that's still unknown, actually. If you're talking about, for example, the highest energy cosmic rays that we've seen in the plot before, we don't know how they are accelerated. We don't even know where they are accelerated, which type of astrophysical environment can be so extreme, so powerful to make cosmic rays with energies like, you know, 10,000 times higher than the LHC. And uh, charged particles, right? Uh, if it's charged particles, usually we have some kind of electromagnetic uh, acceleration. So electromagnetic acceleration is a Simply, we can try to understand as follows. If you are trying to reach one of these energies indicated here by the lines, right? let's take, for example, this uh, blue line uh, of 1,000 EV. EV is an energy that will show up here a few times. That's 10 to the 18 electron volts. Okay? If you are trying to reach like these energies of 1,000 EV, there are a few astrophysical objects that would allow us to reach these energies. And how do we know which type of astrophysical objects can allow us to reach these energies? Well, we can simply look at their typical size and their magnetic field. So if the, this is some kind of uh, electromagnetic acceleration and we have a charged particle, the charged particle will just keep moving around in that environment that we have. And eventually, as the energy grows, the deflection 
So it, the, the LARMA radius, the gyro radius of this particle in that magnetized environment, we start to grow proportionally to the energy of the particle. So therefore, if the particle is being constantly accelerated there inside an astrophysical environment, eventually, the magnetic field of this object will no longer be able to contain the particle inside a given radius. And what happens? Well, the particle escapes. That's how we get high energy particles escaping. This is a very intuitive way to think of it. This is not, of course, accurate. There are other things going on. But to zero for other, I think this is a very uh, easy cartoon. No. Yeah. Exactly. There are many, many possible mechanisms. This is agnostic with respect to the mechanism. This is just telling us where to look. This is useful where to look. For example, uh, you know, we can, it's not worth looking into the solar system. The solar system cannot produce these high energy particles. But these type of objects like neutron star, either the object is small with a very, very strong magnetic field like magnetars, or it's large with a weaker magnetic field like the whole galaxy cluster. You know, uh, that's just telling us where to look. Uh, and uh, essentially, the argument I just gave you gives us like a maximum energy uh, relating this size of the object with the magnetic field. This is the so-called Hilas criterion. The name is irrelevant, but it's essentially this argument. Note here that we are, I also plotted here uh, the LHC. The LHC has a magnet of about, I think it's 7.7 uh, .7 Tesla. Uh, and you know, the LHC like 30 kilometers, kilometers uh, circumference, so we get, you know, a few kilometers radio, so the LHC is here, and therefore the LHC cannot reach the energies of these particles. So these particles, they are undergoing something that we cannot directly probe here at Earth. Uh, yeah. So cosmic rays and electrons, they can be accelerated through this type of process, right? Because they are charged. Uh. Uh, and processes like interactions, like the one I've drawn here. This is a photohadronic interaction. We have a hadron and we have like a photon. Uh, they can produce photons and neutrinos. We also have like hadronuclear processes, like PP, for example, that can produce photons and neutrinos, and so on. Therefore, how do we produce high energy particles? And this relates also to the question that Rogério just made. Uh, well, there are many ways to produce it. The mechanism. It's still unknown how to get it, but essentially it should obey some kind of argument like this. It's probably some type of electromagnetic acceleration. And the gamma rays and the neutrinos, they probably come from the cosmic rays or the electrons that are, ac that are uh, accelerated. The electrons, they die out very quickly because of synchrotron emission. So uh, in most environments, the electrons cannot escape, and uh, they don't do much. So cosmic rays essentially are the key if we want to understand photons and neutrinos being produced in various astrophysical environments. How does this production happen? I don't know, and I won't have time to talk about it, but maybe afterwards, after the talk, if you have questions, we can discuss some of these mechanisms. So when I drew that plot before, and I argued that the fact that the amount of energy, the flux, uh, energy differential energy flux arriving at Earth could be comparable, I said that there are two ways to explain this. Either there is some kind of connection in the astrophysical sources or during propagation. If this connection happens in the astrophysical sources, we have something like cosmic rays or electrons, right? And then they can interact via various types of processes producing neutrinos and gamma rays. The gamma rays can produce electron-positron pairs, which is a very uh, well-known uh, process. Uh, Compton scattering can also produce high-energy gamma rays and so on. Uh, depending on the type of object that we have, we can also have the emission of gravitational waves. And this establishes a link between the different messengers, uh, which is essentially the multi-messenger picture. We have cosmic rays, which atomic nuclei. We have electrons here that probably won't reach Earth, but they are important anyways. We have photons uh, at various frequencies, and we have neutrinos. And if we put all of these together, we can learn what's going on inside the astrophysical source. And the second way is to do like, uh, like uh, study their propagation in intergalactic space, right? Uh, so we have an astrophysical source, let's say outside our own galaxy. It emits some type of particles. These particles can interact, like I said here, with the CMB photon, producing other stuff. In the case of cosmic rays, the cosmic rays will leave this source. 
they are deflected by magnetic fields, hence uh, the curves. Oh. Yeah. Magnetic fields, both extragalactic and galactic. And the process that can happen here is like, since they are atomic nuclei, they can just you know, emit a proton or emit a neutron or emit an alpha particle and so on. And you know, what we actually detect here at Earth in this case could be like a secondary nucleus coming from this interaction. And another type of process, which is the one that I just mentioned before, it's like photon pion production here, uh, in which we have like a proton or a neutron uh, producing like a, you know, pions whose decays can produce neutrinos and photons, like the cosmogenic neutrinos and photons that I already mentioned. And another process that can happen is also like pair production, which is simply like, a, you know, the interaction of a nucleus with a background photon could be the CMB or in the infrared band or whatever, uh, producing an electron-positron pair. And the electrons can help produce more gamma rays, as we will see later. And now, what's the propagation picture for gamma rays? We have a gamma ray leaving the source. And this gamma ray can produce an electron-positron pair. Something happened here, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that's where I am. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, we have like pair production. We are producing an electron positron pair. These pairs. They can, be, they can open up this angle between them uh, in the presence of magnetic fields that are, we know exist in the universe. And these electrons and positrons, they can upscatter like things like CMB photons producing high energy photons that we detect here at Earth. This process may happen several times. This constitutes what we call an electromagnetic cascade. And in the case of neutrinos, well, the propagation picture, it's much simpler. Neutrinos, they do undergo some interactions with matter, but their cross-section is very small, so these interactions are not very common. Uh, but they oscillate, so this is something that has to be taken into account. And this is actually something interesting, because uh, it tells us, more or less, what types of processes are going on producing the neutrinos that we observe. This helps us distinguish, for example, between the two scenarios that I was putting forth. The scenarios in which the production happens at the source or during cosmological propagation. And uh, I mentioned a few photon uh, backgrounds, like the CMB that we know. We also have things uh, in other frequencies, infrared, uh, X-rays, and so on. Uh, usually the dominant ones for the energy range that I'm talking about are the CMB, the dotted lines. Uh, we have also the radio background, which is much fainter. It's here. And we also have this, the so-called uh, EBL, which is the extragalactic background light, which comprises essentially radiation in the infrared and uh, optical, part of the optical. Uh, yeah. OK, I also said that we have uh, intergalactic magnetic fields. Uh, and Intergalactic magnetic fields that affect the propagation of the charged particles, like the electrons or the cosmic rays. And this was supposed to be a video, uh, but I'm just going to explain as a, as a picture. Uh, so if we look here at these uh, dots, the dots are showing clusters of galaxies. The scales that we are talking about here are like maybe uh, 200 megaparsec across. So this is very large. These are based on simulations. And we see that these green dots, which are clusters of galaxies, they are connected by these filamentary structures, right? Uh, which are the so-called, well, filaments. And uh, if we just plot the cumulative distribution of these magnetic fields, that's what we get, but according to different models. So this, is, this plot is showing the cumulative distribution of magnetic fields in the whole, in the large-scale structure of the universe. And why am, am I talking about this? Well, Magnetic fields will essentially tell us how particles propagate in the universe. I'm starting to bring together all the ingredients needed to understand how the particles move and to make sense of the observations that we have. Uh, but what we see is that we don't really know a lot about magnetic fields, right? Uh, we see that these different models, they produce very different 
things. The magnetic fields can be very strong or they can be very weak. But uh, one thing is interesting. We have like these black regions, so essentially where we don't have filaments or clusters, we have the so-called cosmic voids. Cosmic voids are essentially the empty regions in the universe. And the question of whether they are magnetized or not, it's very important to understand how particles propagate there. Because, uh, well, essentially they occupy, I would say, 80% of the volume of the universe, or at least half of the volume of the universe, right? Uh, and if we draw this region here, that's essentially the one corresponding to cosmic voids, right? Because they, uh, that's more or less like 20% of the volume of the universe at least, or more than half. And the conclusion from this slide is essentially that we don't know anything about magnetic fields, which can be good or it can be bad. No. Actually, that's the thing. To measure magnetic fields, the typical techniques, usually you look along a line of sight, and you can look like at the polarization, Faraday rotation, essentially, right? Uh, but if you're talking about cosmic voids, well, they are voids. They are supposedly empty. There is... In galaxies, we can. We can galaxies, we, we can see in clusters, and we can usually do like in situ measurements of the magnetic field. Like in situ is called, uh, for example, in galaxy clusters, they call it in situ uh, Zeeman splitting, for example. You can see the Zeeman splitting of the spectral lines based on the temperature, and that will tell us, tell us that magnetic fields in clusters, they are like you know, 0 0.1 microgauss. Yeah, that would be like 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 11 Tesla. That would be here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, therefore, the magnetic fields, they are there. Uh, but the thing is, you know, I don't have time to talk about this today. It's a topic I work a lot on, uh, which is how to actually measure these magnetic fields in the voids, because there is no actual way to measure magnetic fields in the voids. We can try with Faraday rotation but we don't have instruments good enough for that yet, at least not at very large distances. Uh, gamma rays could be very useful if we think about the picture that I've uh, shown before, because we have like, you know, we have a photon, and we have the production of an electron-positron pair, and this opening angle here, it's proportional to the magnetic field, and this process, well, it's likely to happen in the voids, because the voids dominate most of the volume of the universe. So uh, this is a very nice way that, uh, to study magnetic fields in the universe. With gamma rays, which is surprising, uh, with gamma ray observations. Uh, therefore, magnetic fields are very uncertain, and that's a problem for propagation studies. And now I'm bringing all of this together. I introduced the messengers that I'm talking about, which are cosmic rays, gamma rays, and neutrinos. And uh, I described how they travel in the universe very broadly, of course. Uh, I'm not going into the details now. And how do we actually make sense of the observations? Well, we usually use simulations for that, uh, to make sense of observations of multi-messenger signals. We can compare neutrino and photon fluxes with cosmic ray fluxes within a single simulation, right? Uh, taking into account all the processes that I described. So if we want to simulate a particle traveling in the universe, we need to know its uh, energy spectrum, so the flux, the energy distribution of the emitted uh, particles, what's like, which type of particle was emitted, uh, the distribution of source, if it's just one astrophysical object or several, uh, how this, uh, the source, uh, how bright it is across the history of the universe. And then we have to plug these into some kind of propagation uh, model, right? We need to understand like the, how these particles interact. So essentially it's the particle physics related to this process. So we need to know cross-sections, we need to know mean free paths, we need to know uh, branching ratios. This is the particle physics part. We also need to know if there is some kind of acceleration going on in a given astrophysical environment, uh, background photon fields. In the case of the CMB, that's well known. But uh, in the case of other background photons, we don't really know them very well. We need to know matter fields because this type of process that I described, it can be also P instead of P gamma, uh, and we need to know the magnetic fields. And once we do this type of propagation, you know, the particle travels from their source to Earth, we need to get some kind of output out of this uh, single way of analyzing uh, particle propagation. And the outputs that we are talking about are usually like the energy spectrum that arrives at Earth. Uh, why is this important? Because the energy that the particle with which the particle left a given astrophysical source is not necessarily the same energy with which it arrives. It changes, like 
this type of pr process. Of course, it changes uh, everything that's happening in between. Uh, the particle, as I mentioned before, like cosmic ray can be a nucleus, it can change its composition. It could be like a nitrogen, and what arrives in the end is like a helium nucleus, or it could be originally like a neutrino, right? C there can be a flavor change here in the case of neutrinos. The arrival directions is also important, and the arrival times. And once we have that, this is what we compare with the observations. So this is the full pipeline to actually interpret multi-messenger observations of all the messengers that I'm talking about here today, uh, essentially. And in a self-consistent way, well, we need to use exactly the same ingredients here to really build a picture that it's reliable and it's self-consistent. And how do we actually do this type of modeling? Well, we need to mix all these ingredients. Yeah. And uh, in a self-consistent way for all the messengers. And we need to scan, of course, the full parameter space of uncertainties, as I said. We don't really know, for example, magnetic fields. And this can be done using uh, some kind of multi-messenger simulation framework. And uh, CIR Propa, it's uh, one of these multi-messenger frameworks. And uh, CIR Propa, well, now I'm shamelessly advertising the code that I worked on for in the development for many, many years. But now uh, it's widely used by the cosmic ray community, the gamma ray community, and the neutrino community as well. Uh, it's a very modular Monte Carlo code that takes care of all these processes that I've talked about so far. So whatever cosmic messenger you have in the beginning, you can propagate them in the universe in any type of astrophysical environment that you want, using different ingredients, like you can change the photon backgrounds, you can change the magnetic fields, you can change many of these ingredients that are relevant for interpreting the observations. And, uh, you know, it's uh, modular, it's open, uh, and you can download it from here. And uh, in general, the processes that are taken into account, the interaction processes that are accounted for in CIR Pulpa are, in the case of cosmic rays, like we have photon pion production, which is the one I mentioned here. We have uh, nuclear decays, elastic scattering, so it's essentially nucleus photon just transferring energy to uh, the photon. We have synchrotron emission, dis disintegration of atomic nuclei. In the case of neutrinos, well, they just travel, right, and oscillate. We have photons, like, undergoing pair production, or we have also the higher order process, which is double pair production. In the case of electrons, we have synchrotron emission, inverse Compton scattering, or the higher order correspondent process, uh, triplet pair production. Uh, and Therefore, we, we are moving here towards a unified framework for high-energy multi-messenger studies that puts together all the ingredients that I've been talking about within a single simulation framework and allows us, and allows us to uh, do the simulations and interpret data by various experiments that we have in gamma rays, neutrinos, or cosmic rays. So, but can you say a little more what you did? So you started with some code that existed and you made some improvements or what? No, so originally, CR Propa was, as the name tells you, uh, it started only for this part. It didn't include these other things. Uh, my PhD supervisor, actually, uh, was the one who started it uh, in 2004. And uh, what I did, that was actually my PhD project, was rewrite it from scratch in a modular way, which allowed us to do all this other part here. So this part was already existing. I just rewrote everything in a nicer way. And then uh, I wrote like this, uh, this part of photons and electrons. I did it, uh, for example, during uh, my PhD. Yeah, but when you say right, I mean, so there are all these complicated cosmology equations, magnetic yes. field, and you exactly. computed them. You, you included all of them in the. Yeah, because uh, the point is that uh, the way the code works, it's it's very neat because. So what's the error bar on the code? That depends on the process. But this is the, actually, in, cosmic, in the cosmic ray community, this is the benchmark nowadays. So if you're talking about ultra high-energy cosmic rays, people tend to rely on CR Propa. Uh, this is the benchmark. Okay. But the point of CR Propa is the following. Before that, you had like a code that did everything, but you, it was not modular, it was not organized, it didn't take care of neutrinos and photons and electrons. And now what, uh, after we redesigned it, so of course I did not do everything alone. Uh, this, was, uh, a lar this was essentially my PhD project, but... Uh, you know, I had collaborators because this is huge. This is like a huge tool. I cannot do this alone. 
And the way the code works, it's modular, and it allowed us to more easily uh, the cosmology. Yeah. What does modular mean? What, what does that modular. mean? Modular. It means that. You know, if you want to do some kind of study and ignore the existence of this process, you just don't call it. So essentially what you do is, okay, I want to study a cosmic ray, I add the, the information about it. Because before you did not have any freedom to do it, it was fixed. And uh, the way the code works is very neat actually because uh, it gets like, you know, there is like an emission point, there is like what we call the observer. There is like a source. And we just discretize the space in tiny bins of variable size, but you know, this is not that relevant. This is done in either one or three dimensions. And at each one of these tiny bins, and this is very tiny, we, take, uh, we decide which type of interaction happens, like if we have a cosmic ray. So if we have a cosmic ray here, which type of interaction can happen? If I added to my pipeline all these processes, it will decide what's the most relevant one based on the mean free path. And uh, this process might or might not happen at this step. And then it, the particle moves to the next step. If there is magnetic field, it changes direction. And uh, cosmological effects, which we essentially, you know, we have like energy losses, uh, like the EDT from the expansion of the universe. That's also accounted for at each one of these steps. And if you have any new process that you want to take into account, well, you just have to write the particle physics corresponding to this one process. So if you want to change the kinematics from a standard model, for example, kinematics to something new, you can just do it and it acts exactly here. Uh, so this is modular and uh, it's very easy now to be extended. And it's also being used by the gamma ray community, like for uh, CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which is the next generation of gamma ray observatories, for example. They have been using it, and uh, yeah. So it's a very comprehensive uh, simulation framework. Uh, Rafael, for, for yeah. neutrinos, you said that they, in your code they just propagate. But there is a process called the Glashow process. Yes. I don't remember what's the threshold, but uh, do you include this or not? No, because it tends, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, the, the glacial is essentially the resonance production of a W. Uh, of a Z. Of a Z, sorry, yeah. On the neutrino background. Yeah. So uh, we have, like, uh, this has been observed by the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. You observed? Yeah. There is a paper in Nature Physics 2020 or 2019. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. I'll look it up. So there, there are actually two, uh, two neutrino events in Ice Cube. Okay, I want to say two, forget about the number. I don't know the exact number. But they did observe it. There is a paper on that. So it's above the glacial resonance. It's not the, that the glacial resonance would uh, de deplete the neutrino flux. And so what, what they see is a, a feature in the flux exactly at the energy of the glacial resonance. Oh, okay. Yeah, there is a paper. I can give you the references. Oh, okay. uh, so this is not taken into account here because in principle, it's not dominant at least not with the statistics that we use here. <laughs> the only process for neutrinos. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, unless you are in matter, then you have other processes, depending on the medium. OK, so uh, this is just some of the applications of uh, CR Propa, but let me move on because I've been talking already for. So some of the observations are gamma ray bursts, right? Or yeah. no? It can, for now, I'm agnostic with respect to what's being observed, but yeah, it can be whatever. I see. And are, are all these processes, uh, um, OK. OK, L let me think about yeah. it. OK, so uh, yeah, just uh, following up on this question. For now, I'm being agnostic with respect to what type of astrophysical objects I'm talking about. But you know, this can be whatever you want. You know, the code is also agnostic with respect to the process. You just define a geometry, you define a type of source, and you define what processes you want to be acting uh, at a given time. So, yeah. Yeah, but just for curiosity, so gamma ray bursts. What's the what's the what do people think is the origin of gamma ray bursts? Yeah. Uh, OK, that's uh, not well established. It depends on the type of gamma ray burst that you have. Uh, usually, some gamma ray bursts, 
well, that, that's a different type of question, right? For now, I'm just talking about the particles. But gamma ray bursts, they can, in, in principle, accelerate cosmic rays via some kind of relativistic shocks. So the relativistic, relativistic shocks will accelerate cosmic rays up to energies. In principle, theoretically, you can get 10 to the 19 electron volts. And if you assume that cosmic rays are not protons, but they are atomic nuclei, you get the atomic number. So yeah, you can get to 10 to the 20 electron volts with gamma ray burst. The question is then, and that's not well established, what the environment of the gamma ray burst, because that acts as a target for the interactions of these cosmic rays, and it might actually kill off all the cosmic rays. So ultimately, your question is interesting, because uh, what might happen is that you know, by observing cosmic rays from a gamma ray burst, for example, that might imply that the medium is transparent, and therefore we don't expect neutrinos or gammas, and vice versa. If we see neutrinos and gammas, that means that the environment of the gamma ray burst was dense for cosmic rays interactions. It was opaque. Uh, but for everything that I've been talking about so far, I'm just focusing, I'm just referring to source, observer, and processes, because I'm not committing to any specific ty type of astrophysical source, because that's messy. It's very uncertain. We don't know what sources can reach uh, which energy, uh, and so on. But I do have, uh, I will present something about gamma ray bursts if I have time later on. Yeah, I don't think I'll have enough time. I'll have to jump. So maybe if I can just ask a question, yeah. a very naive one again. So in the very beginning, you had many experiments, different types of experiments. Yes. So which ones are the ones that best apply to you? That uh, you pr probably some you can directly use your results and backtrack where things well, come, and others are more indirect. Can you comment a little bit? On yes, the uh, actually, all that slide contemplates all of the experiments that can help this science case. This science case, well, the title of the talk is this, and I'm referring to ultra high energies. So I'm essentially interested in whatever process that happens at ultra high energies, let's say above 10 to the 18 electron volts, and all the particles that are generated due to these interactions of these ultra high energy particles. So if something starts due to this interaction, like these neutrinos or these photons, that's part of the same science case. And if an experiment you know, is operating in this energy range, and it can tell, tell me something about that energy range, it's valid. But just to answer your question, the experiment here, it's like Fermi, the Fermi Large Area Telescope. Uh, here at uh, this energy, we don't have any data, but if we take this energy here and above up to 10 to the 14, that would be like experiments like CTA in the future, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, or currently MAGIC has, which are the so-called imaging air Cherenkov telescopes. Uh, in this energy range, we essentially just have ice cube and uh, KM3Net, which is the European version, right? Uh, they are slightly different. KM3Net is not, it's still being built, but ice cube, it's collecting data and we have many things going on. Uh, here, that would be OG, which is the state of the art. There is also the telescope array, which is slightly, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the number of events detected, the statistics is much lower, actually by a factor, I think, 10. Uh, compared to OG. So the state of the art at this energy, it's OG. Uh, which one? Chime. Chime is actually for uh, radio. I think uh, they are trying to do some kind of observations. Uh, yeah, that would be like f minus eight, I think, in energy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could also claim that, you know, under my definition, that would also apply, but I'm not looking into those energies. I'm just looking above 1 GV for the record. Uh, yeah. So in the beginning, I was, uh, I was asking whether there was a connection, like, uh, you know, if this connection could be cosmogenic. These, these photons here and these neutrinos could be due to these cosmic rays that we are seeing here. And to answer that, we have to take a look into the cosmic ray observations today. The Pierre Roger Observatory, it's detecting cosmic rays. Uh, it's the state-of-the-art observatory today. Detect, detecting cosmic rays above 10 to the 17-ish electron volts. And this is the flux, you know, this is the essentially forget the E squared. That's what we are seeing here. Oh, that's what we are seeing actually here, yeah. Oh no, this is EV21. So it's essentially E squared, D3N, DA, the DA, DT, D. That's the plot here at the top. And uh, this 
so-called X-Max, it's a proxy for the composition of the cosmic ray, right? Uh, it can be like a proton nucleus, which is essentially hydrogen, or it could be something like nitrogen, and so on. And if we compare these two things, like the energy spectrum and the composition, we can try to make sense of these observations to answer the question that I just asked. Can this origin be cosmogenic? Can this relation be to the cosmogenic production of neutrinos and photons? And to do that, we can use some kind of astrophysical model that fits the observations by the pierre Hergé Observatory. I'm not taking into account the data by the other observatory, just the pierre Hergé Observatory, and fit these two observables, the energy spectrum and the composition of these cosmic rays here, right? And if we just play this game of trying to fit and find the parameter space, that fits uh, assuming different compositions for the cosmic rays. So if we just assume that cosmic rays are a, combina a, co a combination of, you know, uh, X percent protons plus X percent Y percent nitrogen, same thing for iron and several types of nuclei, with a given emission spectrum, you know, uh, a power law spectrum, E to a given uh, power. That, and we fit the data with that, this is the flux of cosmogenic neutrinos that we get. So uh, once again, just to repeat, if we fit the flux of cosmic rays measured by the pierre Hergé Observatory, assuming that it can be like a combination of protons, helium, nitrogen, silicon, and iron, there are motivations for this choice, okay? Uh, astrophysical motivations to choose these five uh, types of composition. And at the same time, we also fit the composition observed by the observatory, and then, based on this idea, when I say fit, what do I mean? I mean, we say something that's happening at the source, we assume some kind of emission for the source, this composition, and then we just use CR Propa, the code, to do the propagation up to Earth. We collect all that flux of cosmic rays, we fit the measurements, and then, based on this model, these results, we go back to our simulation and we compute the flux of neutrinos and photons. That's what we do here. And th this is the expectation for the number of cosmogenic, the flux of cosmogenic neutrinos that we expect fitting the data by the pierre Hergé Observatory. Here we have the data by the Neutrino Observatory IceCube that is currently operating. Uh, here it's uh, one of the projects that I I'm involved with, Grant. Uh, so in three years, Grant probably would not have enough sensitivity for that, but in 10 years, Grant could reach part of this parameter space. Yeah. So why, why are you ignoring the telescope array? It seems to be incompatible with uh, a Tricky question, but yeah. It's, uh, the thing is, they don't make their data public. Neither does Auger, but Auger makes the data public at least to you know, cl collaborators afterwards. Because when Auger published uh, a paper, they make the data public by doing that. The telescope array doesn't. So I don't have like systematic uncertainties. I don't know. Because here, I'm, look, uh, I'm using like the mean value of x max, so essentially the mean value of the composition. Uh, for OG, I actually have the distribution, not only the, the mean. For the telescope array, I only have the mean. There is no way of doing that. OK, thanks. Uh, and I can play the same game for also the photons. And the photons, like, uh, look at the energy range once again. The is different, right? Uh, because there are like those processes of pair production, inverse Compton, the whole electromagnetic cascade, which transfers energy down to, down to these energies of TV or GV or so. And we see that actually part of this parameter space that's compatible here, it's actually overshot, right? If we take like the 9% nine, 9 confidence band for the predictions here, part of the photon, so part of the models that we assume to fit the OG data can already be excluded by this gamma ray data. Uh, we comment about that on this, uh, on this paper. Anyways, uh, but the parameter space is huge. We see here it can go from 10 to the minus 7, nearly 10 to the minus 7, down to less than 10 to the minus 11. So this is a huge parameter space. Therefore, to answer the question that I asked in the beginning, is there a cosmogenic connection? Well, it's not really clear. Then my next question is, is there a source connection? And to motivate this discussion, I use as an example galaxy clusters. What is shown here? It's a single galaxy cluster 
right? And in the center here, there are three cosmic rays of 10 to the 18 electron volts being injected, and I simulate their trajectories with shear propa. Uh, and here, uh, the color bar indicates the magnetic field of this one cluster uh, of galaxies. And we see, if we compare this energy, 10 to the 18 electron volts, with 10 to the 17 electron volts, we go back to that argument that I was making in the beginning, that magnetic fields, uh, that uh, magnetic fields, you know, confine cosmic rays particles of lower energy. As you can see here, they just keep closer to the center of this cluster before they can escape. And here, they actually escape faster. And if we just assume that all galaxy clusters, they have cosmic ray sources in them, and we just model the interaction of these cosmic rays with the gas in the galaxy clusters and the photons and everything in there in the magnetic fields, and we do that for all the clusters in the universe of different mass and so on, and we compute the flux of photons and neutrinos, we see that actually galaxy clusters alone, which is, you know, we know galaxy clusters exist, it's very simple, alone they can already nearly explain the observations of uh, the diffuse gamma ray flux by Fermilat and by, uh, of neutrinos by Ice Cube, right? Uh, and this is something very standard. Therefore, there might not be a lot of room for other components if this is really true. Of course, there are uncertainties like the exact number of cosmic ray sources in the galaxy cluster, uh, the density of things, uh, and there are some uncertainty bands. And even these uncertainty bands, they could probably go up or down by a factor 10 or 100, depending on the uh, a scenario that we are taking into account. Yep. This is a simulation, right? This is a simulation, yes. So, uh, so you just just assume that there is a particle with this energy? And then with a spectrum. A I spectrum e to the minus 2, which is typical for a cluster. Between e to the minus 1.5 and e to the minus 2.5. That's typical for clusters. And in, you know, the band is actually this spectrum. So you don't, OK. So you, you don't know what is accelerating them, but you just assume an X spectrum. Yes. And this is full hydro simulation? This year, it's full. Uh, uh, MHD. This MHD, the cluster yes. is MHD. Yeah. Magneto hydrodynamics. Okay. Yeah. And then we put like uh, in them the use CR propa. Use the MHD simulation as a background in CR propa, and we run the simulation. Okay. This is actually computationally very very expensive to do this. Uh, that's why this was the PhD work of uh, Sakib Hussein, who was actually working here uh, at uh, USP some time ago when I was there. Uh, you know, we did this together, and we use CR propa. Uh, this is very expensive computationally because it requires sim MHD simulations of clusters in the universe in a large volume and then CR propa simulations of individual particles. And for each cluster, you need ten, tens of thousands of particles to reach enough statistics. So why, why we just see one, a few particles there? Why, why? Well, I've just drawn a few particles so that you could see it. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so the conclusion is that clusters of galaxies, which is something that we know exist, and you know, usually sources of cosmic rays or whatever type of particles, they are probably in a galaxy cluster anyways. This could explain most of the diffuse flux of neutrinos and gamma rays, which is very interesting. And uh, that's what I call the source connection, right? This is a real possibility. And... Now, uh, in the beginning, I was asking about source or cosmogenic. There seems to be, you know, something interesting about the source case. But to really be sure, we should look at individual objects. And I should ask you, how, what should I do here? Because I, uh, I can probably just go to the GRB part, because there was a question on that. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to say 10. Okay. Yeah, 10 to 15. Okay, so I might skip then uh, one of the things, but uh, or maybe go faster. So uh, in the beginning, I asked about you know I drew a horizontal line and I s speculated whether it's possible that there is like a relation between the mechanism that produces accelerates these particles and these two fluxes of neutrinos and photons. And uh, I argued in my last slide that you know it's possible that sources like galaxy clusters could explain this relation. But now we also have to take a look at individual sources. And uh, let's take a look at this object, TXS0506. Uh, 
this is a blazer. A blazer is an active galactic nucleus with a jet pointing exactly towards Earth or very close uh, to, you know, uh, uh, to Earth. And it was observed in 2017 by the IceCube Neutrino Observatory. It observed a, a few neutrino events in the direction of this blazer. And this same object was at the same time emitting electromagnetic radiation across the whole spectrum, like radio, infrared, and so on, and also gamma rays. So what you are seeing here is actually the gamma rays uh, in the direction of this object. And this is actually the first uh, neutrino plus uh, gamma ray source at this energy. So this is a true multi-messenger event. Here we are seeing the electromagnetic spectrum down from low, low energies up to high energies. Uh, here we have the ice cube observations. And the question that we could ask is, OK, since we observe this coincidence, and I've been talking about this for a while, are these two things uh, related? Could these neutrinos and photons have been produced by some kind of ultra-high energy process in this blazer? Well, if that's true, there should be, you know, should expect the neutrino spectrum to extend to higher energies, and we should see something, but we don't. Uh, this ribbon that we see here at the top, this is a work that we did uh, in the, uh, as a member. I was a member of the Pierre Roger collaboration, and we did this analysis, observing, uh, looking for neutrinos, extending the observations by ice cube, which is shown here in blue, up to high energies, and we don't see any ultra high energy event from this blazer, which is telling us that either this is not an ultra high energy source, or at least the composition of the cosmic rays there. It's not like protons or something that produces a lot of neutrinos. It could be something else. And uh, now I'm going to what I actually wanted to discuss uh, today, which is the last part of my talk, uh, about this event, this gamma ray burst. Since there was a question about gamma ray bursts already, GRB 221009, so it was observed last year on the 9th of October. This was the brightest GRB ever observed. Uh, and what's interesting about this GRB is actually not only that it's the brightest GRB that we've ever seen uh, here on Earth. Short. Yeah, this is probably like a collapsar or yeah, some type of collapsar. So, uh, and before, I've shown that, you know, if we have a source like, you know, we have a gamma ray burst, therefore there are gamma rays. What happens with gamma rays is that they, when they are traveling from their source to Earth, over, over cosmological distances, they interact with uh, photons producing electron positron pairs. And we also have like processes such as inverse Compton scattering and so on. And what we see here is actually the result of this cascade process. Rafael, can you just remind me what is the uh, threshold energy for the photon to interact with background? Uh, I have a plot for that. Because I don't it's remember. Coming. Yeah, it's coming, yeah. So. Uh, What's interesting about this GRB is that there is an observatory of gamma rays uh, in China called uh, LASSO. And it claims to have observed from this object, which is at a redshift of, you know, a distance of 650 megaparsec. It claims to have observed events, gamma rays, with energy of up to... There are uh, spectroscopic measurements. This object was observed like across the whole spectrum, so there, there is a lot of data. Uh, and the error bar here, I think it's uh, in the third or fourth uh, decimal point. It's 0, 1, 5, 0 something. Yeah, it's, this is a good enough approximation. Uh, and Lasso claims to have observed events of energy close to 20 TeV. But for an object so far away at this distance, and that's the question that uh, Rogério was about to make, we don't expect to see gamma rays from this distance. Why? Well, because they interact with photons in between. And uh, you know, if, even if we take into account all the models that we have for the EBL, which is the photon background that dominates at these energies, we don't really expect to see a lot of photons coming from this uh, object at these high energies. So if we just draw like the, the 20 TV energy, it's actually 18. Uh, if we just draw here, what we are seeing here is the inverse mean free path for the process of pair production in different types of background. We have the CMB, we have like the EBL, and so on. If we just draw here, like these red uh, lines, 
we see that the mean free path should be something like 10 to the minus 1 or 10 to the minus 2, whose inverse is 100. But this object is at 650, and the mean free path is 100. Therefore, we don't expect a significant flux of 20 TV gamma rays, because pair production should happen. This is very anomalous, right? So the day after this event was announced, you know, if you opened the archive, there were a bunch of articles and people were saying, OK, the universe is, not, is more transparent than we thought. When we say transparency, it means that this process. Like, otherwise, you'd never be able to see, to see the 20 TeV uh, photons. And people were just saying that, you know, uh, it could be like Lorentz invariance violation, or it could be like, uh, which would imply, for example, superluminal photons or action like particles, and so on. Yep. Yes, so, 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 of course, the CMB is, is there. So we know the CMB is there. It's there, yeah. So the CMB doesn't matter for this process, right? Not at this energy, if, no. If it were only CMB, this would happen. I mean, you would, Lasso yeah. would be right. Yes. So the question is about the other photons that are not CMB, and then there's a lot of model dependence there. Yeah, but the model dependence is this, are these lines. Okay, not so, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not a model dependence strong enough, you know? So, okay. You know, so people were very excited about all this possibility for new physics. And uh, the question then becomes, okay, every time there is some kind of anomalous event, people get very excited about new physics. But is there really new physics? Isn't there just a standard model explanation for all these type of things? Well, and uh, this, uh, in this work here, <coughs> what I did was essentially just to look into this event, you know, the interaction, like the pair production, would imply a strong cutoff before the energy of the event observed by Lasso. Here, it's this green band. What if this gamma ray burst is actually, uh, connecting, to, connecting to Pedro's question, it's actually a gamma, uh, gamma, this gamma ray burst is, burst is actually an ultra high energy cosmic ray source. What would happen? Well, if we just make some assumptions about the properties of this cosmic ray source, like the maximum energy it can reach, or the composition, so uh, the composition of the cosmic rays there, and uh, so on. We could try to explain this event. And if we just, you know, do, do some kind of simulation and put together other processes, like nucleus plus photon and everything together, we see that we can actually explain this quite well. We expect, actually, 18 TV photons from an ultra high energy cosmic ray source, which is very interesting. So this is not, nothing absurd. And this is a very standard scenario. So we could, in principle, explain this uh, object, this gamma ray burst, the brightest ever, without any need for new physics. And uh, the main, one of the main processes that would happen is like uh, this, the Beth-Heitler pair production, which is essentially a nucleus plus gamma producing like an electron-positron pair. And the electron-positron pair then, via inverse Compton scattering, produces these gamma rays that we are observing. So what happens is, when Okay. When it leaves the source, when uh, the cosmic ray leaves the source, the source is like at 0 0.151 redshift, it starts uh, producing pairs and producing a bunch of things like uh, uh, this, like this process, like photon pion production. And uh, here it's the energy of uh, the electron at this given redshift, right? And this is the energy of the progenitor cosmic ray. As we get closer to Earth, so redshift 0.2, 12. Uh, the color here doesn't matter much, uh, but what matters is that black here is higher. And as we get closer to Earth, we get still a lot of electrons being produced very close to Earth. So effectively, the fact that these electrons are produced very close to Earth means that there is a source of electrons, which then inverse Compton scatters photons to high energies, closer to Earth. And that makes a source not that far away. And therefore, there is no pro pair production anomaly, like many people was claiming. And this observation can be explained you know, very nicely just considering this type of process without any need for new physics. And most importantly, I think this is a strong claim, but uh, it might be true, actually, that this gamma ray burst might be the first source of ultra high energy cosmic rays that we ever observed here from Earth, even though it's indirect. Uh, and the neutrinos that we expect to be compatible with the scenario, like the, li the color lines are corresponding. Uh, this is for photons, this is for neutrinos. They are in an energy range that we cannot actually measure with experiments like IceCube. 
And uh, I'll just skip over to the conclusions. Uh, so yeah, in the beginning, I, I was showing this plot here. <coughs> and I was saying that we don't really know if there is a connection between these different messengers and so on. And I was discussing whether there is a common origin or not, uh, which is not clear. Uh, the cosmogenic case, it's very hard to make, considering the cosmic ray data that we have today. So this is likely not produced by this cosmic rays, because the flux of cosmogenic neutrinos and photons is very low. And this uh, brings me back to one of the points that was already raised today, how to disentangle between a source and a cosmogenic signal, which is very important. I think this is a win either way, because we have never detected cosmogenic fluxes. If, we did, if the, flux, uh, the cosmogenic flux is high, great, we can just detect them. But if it's low, well, cosmogenic fluxes are a background for you know, neutrino astrophysics to do some kind of science, uh, astrophysical sciences with neutrinos. With neutrino. So, uh, yeah, either way, I think this is a win. Uh, even if the cosmogenic flux is high, we can, uh, we can detect them or we can do some kind of astrophysics. And... Uh, these lines here, what's interesting is that in the future, I did not have time to discuss it, but if we just extrapolate these measurements, you know, these slopes to higher energies, what's going on? If we have more data here, do we expect this to be suppressed? Or do we expect this to start coming back up at higher energies, for example, the purple one? And even the, the cosmic ray line, what would happen? You know, if we had like this line starting to go up again. It's, this, is, this limitation is just because we don't have instruments sensitive enough to observe these energy ranges. But it doesn't mean that the universe doesn't produce this type of particles. It just means that we cannot measure them. And uh, one of the things that I find most interesting is that these ultra energy messengers in general and high energy messengers, they can be used, as I mentioned in the beginning, as cosmological probes. If we know all these astrophysical details that I've been talking about today, and as probes of fundamental physics and cosmology. And this is actually what I'm going to focus specifically on my talk tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to focus on, you know, today I describe the astrophysics. Tomorrow I will describe more this part, the particle physics side of things, uh, these things, uh, what could happen and how can we do studies of physics beyond their standard model using high energy messengers. And just to close, uh, you know, in the future, we will have more sensitive experiments that will allow us to probe these higher energies, like CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array. There is a very strong Brazilian participation in this project here in Sao Paulo, Sao Carlos, uh, uh, Rio. Uh, uh, GRAND, for example, which is the giant radio array for neutrino detection, uh, with, with which I'm very involved. It will observe, it's targeting neutrinos, but it can also measure other types of particles, because it's uh, an air shower detector, essentially. And this one, which for now is just a concept, uh, GCOS, it's the Global Cosmic Ray Observatory, which is meant to be the successor of OG and uh, TA in the future. Right? Uh, and that's all I had to say. Yeah, thank you. So aside from measuring other energies, what else will the new experiments do to help you? It sounds like... I don't know how much progress was made over the last 10 or 15 years about yeah. that. Okay, that's a very good and I think very important question that I also ask myself a lot. There is a very strong science case for like CTA, because a CTA, we, this, is the, these are, this flux is diffuse, right? This is all sky. But CTA will be like a closer to a traditional observatory because it can observe single astrophysical events with a precision, unprecedented precision. So there is a strong case for CTA, like it can observe, you know, uh, it can do a lot of astrophysics. There is a strong case for GRAND, like to do neutrino astronomy at high energies, because uh, ice cube, it stops here. So there is also a strong case for this. The case for GCOS, in my personal opinion, and this is an opinion here, it's more feeble, because OG has been detecting a lot of particles. You know, it has high statistics, uh, but it hasn't really answered the fundamental questions. We don't, still don't know what the sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays are. We learned that they, are, they don't come from the galaxy. Well, that's something, but uh, I don't think that's good enough. We learned that they might come from the closest uh, active galactic nucleus, the closest AGN, which is Centaurus A. 
they might, but this is still not clear. There is a case, but it's not strong enough, in my opinion. However, with like an observatory with 10 times the exposure of OG, we might get higher statistics to answer some of these questions, ultimately. Yeah, so every time I hear talk about cosmic rays, I'm surprised that um, people say well, we have no clue where they come from. I mean, aren't AGN an obvious candidate for source of yes. cosmic rays? So where are GRBs? GRBs are also obvious candidates. Yes. But G the, the isn't the connection between GRB and AGN established? At least no. for uh, they are very for different. class, of course. G gamma ray burst. A GRB. Oh, yes, yeah. GRB, yeah. They are very different types of objects. Uh, the only con commonality between the two of them, I would say, it's the, the fact that they both have a, high, uh, have a relativistic jet. Because the relativistic jet will give you like the boost that you need in energy. Other than no, that, but, but I mean, the, the long ones, are, aren't they supposed to be all AGNs, the long GRBs? They, some of them could be, yes. Uh, the, yeah, it's possible, it's possible, but it doesn't necessarily answer the question, right, uh, of what the cosmic ray sources are. Because not all AGNs are GRBs, they are very different processes. No, sure, I, I mean, uh, the AG, I mean, the AGN might not point to us, I mean, uh, there are... Yes. There are a lot of, uh, I mean, dirty details. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they are, they are by far the most energetic uh, engine we see in the universe. So are, aren't they an obvious candidate? Yes, they are. But the fact that they are candidates still doesn't change the picture, right? We still cannot be sure that things are coming from there. And without experiments to actually prove it, we are still in the dark, I would say. Uh, and, there are, and that doesn't also answer the question because it might not be the only source population. There might be other things going on. It might not even be the dominant source. Yeah, what else then? So, yeah, uh, that, that's one of the things I had. Yeah, I won't go back all the way, but that's one of the things that I had in one of my first slides. Whatever answer, yeah, actually, I should go back. Uh, it, it answers exactly your question. Uh, This one. If you look here, things that fall on top of the line, they are allowed. So whatever has, like, it, can, it either has to be big with a low magnetic field or have a very strong magnetic field if it's small. Magnetars are still candidates. Like neutron stars, some types, white dwarfs, uh, not convinced of that. Uh, like high luminosity, gamma ray bursts. The afterglow of a gamma ray burst as well. Uh, starburst galaxies, there is a strong correlation. Actually, this is something of the, to, uh, connecting to what uh, Nathan was asking earlier. This is actually one of the things that we learned in recent years. There is a four, uh, over four sigma correlation with starburst galaxies. Starburst galaxies are just galaxies that have a, a very intense activity of uh, star formation. And that means that, you know, Something go is going on there that uh, accelerates cosmic rays to high energies because, you know, either via the, the young uh, objects, because we have star formation there, we have some young objects uh, like magnetar or these type of things that can contribute to, the, to this acceleration. Yeah, so it's just a particular type of uh, astrophysical object, but still, that doesn't answer the question because when you hear talks about uh, cosmic rays and so on, people say, okay, it's coming in the direction of X. Okay, but X, it's a cluster of galaxies. Come on, there are, it's a cluster of galaxies. There are at least, you know, tens or hundreds of galaxies in there. It doesn't answer from which galaxy it comes, nor how it's accelerated. So even if we know where it comes from, we still don't know how it's accelerated. That's why we need to have information from the other messengers as well. Okay, but is still, you're telling me that it's still not possible to rule out, I mean, uh, uh, astrophysics, I mean, Small sources like uh, individual stars. No, no stars. Possible. Stars. Uh, I mean, like neutron star and white dwarfs. I mean, it's not possible to rule them out. No. I mean, how can they be so energetic, coming from? Yeah, yeah. There are some. Uh, okay, it's possible to rule them as the sole source. So, if they are the only source of the cosmic rays, that can be ruled out. Hmm. I think. 
But still, there is some kind of uh, some matters that these uh, objects they usually emit cosmic rays via some kind of like magnetized, you know, the uh, the flip of the magnetic field in the poles of the the, the star. Uh, what is that called? I forgot the name. Okay, yeah, but I mean, yeah. I, I guess they cannot get to the rate we need, probably. Yes, uh, theoretically not. It's very difficult. Uh, you, but. You can rule them out as the sole source, but not as a source. Yeah, yeah. I think this, this is very messy. That's why uh, I focused on talking about all the other messengers, because I think this connection, it's very interesting. I think like the, the case for the gamma ray burst that I mentioned in the end. You know, I don't think you can do a lot by just observing cosmic rays, but putting them together within a single framework, the interpretation, it might make sense. It's, I think this is a new avenue. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Rafael.